Welcome to the Parsha Podcast. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Walby. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I appreciate any and all feedback. I am speaking to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. It is a great honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be giving you this Parsha Podcast on Parshas Yisro. As I mentioned in previous weeks, if you have not yet gone to our website, torchweb.org, and ordered your very own mitzvah magnets, your very own torch, Shabbat light switch covers, you can still do that. We'll ship them to you for free. Visit our website, torchweb.org. On the homepage, you'll see a banner. Click on the banner, put in your information, make sure you put in the correct mailing address so we know where to ship it, and we will ship it to you for free. Parshas Yisro has a very unusual and strange protagonist. The father-in-law of Moshe, Jethro, is one of the most interesting personalities in the whole Torah. He arrives at a very crucial time in our history. His storyline is sandwiched between the major founding events of our nation. We have the Exodus, and we have the Splendid of the Sea last week. We have the first war the Jewish people have. They get the manna last week. They have water made from Iraq. And this week, we have, of course, the most significant, pivotal, transformational, transcendental event of all of human history. We have the revelation at Sinai, and right in between them, we have this interlude, this intermission, when the father of Moshe, Jethro, Yisro, arrives, and there's a whole celebration. We're given all kinds of seemingly unnecessary details, the stories that were told to him. He got goosebumps. He makes declarations. He offers sacrifices. There is a festive banquet that is done in his honor, and he arrives out of the blue, and then he disappears in a flash. Apparently, he doesn't even stick around for the Sinai revelation, and it's kind of odd why you have this break in the narrative from these pivotal nation-building events to this storyline about Yisro, and the story itself is also a little bit strange. You know, he gives this very important, apparently, advice to create a hierarchical system where there's the lower courts and you have competent integrity-possessing judges who judge the simple cases, and you have Moses all the way at the top judging only the most difficult and challenging cases. It seems like that's really all he comes to contribute. And why this would be placed, why this narrative would be placed right over here, it kind of demands an answer. It's given prime real estate when it doesn't seem like his contribution is that great. Moreover, if you read the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, you'll discover that this wasn't really only Yisro's idea. His idea was not so revolutionary. Why? Because in the beginning of Deuteronomy, this story is retold, the story of Moshe creating this system of lower courts and lower judges and higher courts. And the role of Yisro is omitted the second time it's mentioned. So the commentaries suggest that, well, maybe Yisro had this idea, but others had this idea as well, and therefore Yisro... His role is not necessary when we tell over the story in Deuteronomy. But that intensifies our question. If Yisro's role is so minor, even in the storyline that he does play a role in, why is it necessary for us to be told this all over here at this very critical juncture of the nation, given prime real estate, the run-up to Sinai right between the splitting of the sea, the war with Amalek, we read the story of Yisro. And in fact, the Parsha, is named after Jethro, after Yisro, the father-in-law of of Moshe. It's not just any parsha. The parsha that contains the most important event in the whole Torah and arguably the most important event in human history. A nation experiences prophecy transcending the normal limitations of human life and is able to experience the word of God directly during the Ten Commandments at Sinai. The most important parsha, perhaps, in the Torah is named after this very unusual character, Yisro, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moshe, of Moses. And in general, you find many unusual aspects to his story. So Rashi tells us, quoting from the Talmud, that for some reason, Yisro is given seven different names. He's called Ruel, Yeser, Yisro, Chovav, Chever, Keni, Putiel. And each one of these different names that he's called in scripture, they all have a meaning why he is called that name. And in Jewish philosophy, the idea of someone having multiple names, it's it's usually reserved for people of very important distinction. For example, Moshe, we're told, has lots of different names. Tov, Tuvia, Avidar, of course, Moshe. But usually it's reserved for the greatest leaders that we have. You know, Abraham was Abraham. He's turned into Abraham. Sarah, Sarai, 
Jacob is called Israel. Joshua was originally Hoshea. He's turned into Joshua, to Yehoshua. And it's odd that this very marginal character Yisro is given also this important distinction of having multiple names, not just multiple names, seven names. Moreover, we're told that he was an experienced idolater. He wasn't just a regular standard pagan. He worshipped every other god in the world. And now, when he discovers what happens to the Jewish people and he hears all the stories, now he says, okay, now I know the truth. It's really odd that someone who has such a checkered past, someone whose background is so dubious, is given such an important distinction in the Torah. Why is the Torah making such a big fuss about Jethro, about Yisro? And he appears, of course, earlier in, in Exodus. He appears in this week's Parsha. And he appears in Numbers chapter 10. And there, if you read it, there's a whole long back and forth. He wants to leave. Moshe is pleading with him to stay. Obviously, there's something very special about Yisro that's invaluable to the nation. And therefore, we have to discover what exactly that is. Why exactly does Yisro matter? There's an added component to this question. The Talmud records a very long debate as to when this story that Yisro arrives and gives this advice, when did it happen? Did it happen before the Sinai experience or did it happen after the Sinai experience? And if you read Rashi and the Ramban at the beginning of this week's parsha, they too are following different storylines. According to Rashi, this happened after the Sinai experience. According to the Ramban, it happened prior to the Sinai experience. So it's interesting. According to Rashi, the story of Yisro actually happened chronologically post the Sinai experience. Yet the chronology is altered to present this story before Sinai. Now, I want to point out the fact that the Torah is not chronological or not necessarily chronological, that appears everywhere. We know that. That's true. The Talmud talks about it. It's undeniable if you read all the scripture. But there has to be a very good reason why the chronology would be altered. Why, according to Rashi at least, and according to the position of the Talmud that says that Yisrael came after Sinai, why was his story so important that it needs to be brought before the Sinai narrative in our Parsha? So this year I saw an amazing Midrash, and I think it would be a good framing for our discussion. The Midrash quotes a verse in Psalms, Ashrei tivchar v'sikarev yishton chatzirecha, which means praiseworthy is he that you choose and he that you bring close, he shall dwell in your courtyard, says the Midrash. What does this mean? Praiseworthy is someone who is chosen by God, even though God did not bring them close. And praiseworthy is someone who God brought close, even though he wasn't chosen. So what it's telling us is that some people God chooses, but doesn't bring close. And some people God brings close, but doesn't choose. And it gives a list. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, these four people, are people that God chose, but God didn't bring close, and they had to bring themselves close. And then it gives a list of two people that God brought close, but didn't choose. And they are Yisro and Rachav, Rachav the prostitute that appears in the book of Joshua. Incidentally, both Yisro, both Jethro, and Rachav, both of them are converts. And both of them, were told here in the Midrash, God brought close, but didn't choose. And then it gives us Aaron. Aaron, he is doubly blessed. Not only was he chosen, but he was also brought close. And therefore, when the verse says, praiseworthy is he who is chosen and is brought close, he shall dwell in your courtyard. That's a reference to Aaron, to the Kohen. He's going to be the one who's going to be in the courtyard of God because he has both distinctions. Not only was he chosen, he was also brought close. What does this mean to be chosen by God, to be brought close to God? So my grandfather, blessed memory, used to explain that when someone is chosen, it means that God pointed to them, they're going to be the father, they're going to be the founder of a great world. Abraham, Moses, Jacob, David, these are people who spawned absolute dynasties. And then you have people who weren't chosen necessarily, and they didn't create a dynasty per se, but they were uplifted and they were given prominence and salience above all the people of their generation. And that is Yisro and Rachav. 
And I think this does sharpen our question. Yisro is different all the honor when he has had such an unusual backstory, such an unusual past. Why exactly was Yisro brought so close to God? So my grandfather of blessed memory spoke about this idea of Yisro and the role that he plays and why he preceded Sinai. My grandfather spoke about this several times and offered several ideas, and we're going to take one of his ideas and expand it. My grandfather tells us that there was something really special about Yisro. In this world, you have people who just live life going with the flow. They're born into a certain family. And they don't necessarily question the environment, the world, the culture that they're in, or even maybe the religion that they have been indoctrinated with since a youth. And they just live life and they don't, they don't depart from the prescribed trajectory of their lives. And then you have those people who are truth seekers, who are searchers, who are always trying to change or question or try to perfect the outlook, the perspective that they have. These people don't subsist with what they've been told necessarily. They don't necessarily just accept everything as dogma, as unimpeachable, as unquestionable. They're always trying to improve themselves, always trying to improve the life in which they live. And here we see someone who is the paradigmatic example of a seeker, of a searcher. Why would someone worship every idol in the world? He's obviously on the lookout for something. He wants something. He's searching for truth. He's a seeker. He's a searcher. He's pursuing something. And that's really special. Of course, no one's advising anyone to pursue idolatry, but there is something noteworthy about Yisro. He was always searching. And what happens when he arrives at the truth, when he discovers all these miracles that God is doing? God's humbling Pharaoh and the Egyptians. God's saving the Jewish people, splitting the sea, doing all these miracles. He arrives at the truth. And what does he do right then and there? So the verse tells us, Vayichad Yisro. The word Vayichad can mean a lot of different things. It says the Talmud, according to one of the opinions. What it means is, he took something very sharp. Yisro heard the truth and he took something very sharp. The word chad means sharp. What did he take? He took a sharp knife and circumcised himself. Immediately, once Yisro arrived at the truth, he arrived at the destination of his journey, he took action. He took something really sharp, circumcised himself, converted, and joined the team, joined the Jewish nation. This is a very valuable outlook that we have to have. We're going to be given Torah in this week's parsha. What are we going to do with it? We're going to be given the truth. It's going to be presented to us on a silver platter. We have to learn, we have to take the lesson of Yisro to say what happens when you find the truth, you act upon it. You take concrete steps to integrate it, to absorb it, to digest it, to make it change your life. Moreover, my grandfather added, Yisro was someone who was always seeking to find clarity in matters of faith. We perhaps may think, if we're fortunate enough to grow up in an environment steeped with the rich heritage of, of Jewish history and, and Jewish life and Torah, we may think, you know what, that part of our lives, faith, well, that's the box that we already have checked. After all, we grew up in a very wholesome Jewish environment. And therefore, we could pursue other spiritual agenda because faith is already covered. But faith, it's not a yes, no, binary, on, off question. Faith is something we have to always strive to enlarge, to augment, to make our faith as true, as impregnable as possible. And Yisro here is the model. He was someone, when he arrived at truth, it was so clear, it was so unimpeachable, he had already gone through all the other false faiths, and now he's taking action once he arrives at the truth. I want to suggest another angle to, to Yisro's salience, and of course this is building upon what my grandfather already said. The Talmud gives us some very interesting details about his backstory. So the Talmud, book of Sotah, page 11a, it's also brought down in Sanhedrin. Talmud tells us that Yisro was originally Egyptian, and he wasn't just an ordinary Egyptian. 
he was actually part of Pharaoh's triumvirate, Pharaoh's inner circle, Pharaoh's advisory board, his cabinet, when they were discussing what to do with the Jews. Pharaoh had a Jewish problem. He gathered in his closest advisors. One of them was Yisrael. The other two, by the way, says the Talmud, was one of them was Bilam. Of course, we'll meet him later on in the book of Numbers. And one of them was Job. And he asks them what to do. What do we do with these Jews? They're taking over the country. And we know ultimately he chose to enslave them, torment them, oppress them. But the three advisors gave him very different advice. Bilam, the wicked one, he gave him advice. Go, go torment them. Go oppress them. Go enslave them. Go massacre them. That was Bilam's advice. And as a result of that, he was killed. Job, he was quiet. He said nothing. He didn't advise not here, not there. And therefore, we know the story of Job. He was someone that was condemned to live a life of brutal suffering. Yisrael, he escaped. He didn't want to partake in this horrific advisory board. And as a result of that, says the Talmud, his descendants, they sat in the marble chamber, meaning they were part of the greatest body of Jews, the Sanhedrin. They were part of the leadership of the Jewish people as a result of his valorous and noble act of escaping from Pharaoh's advisory board. And I think this this does add another interesting wrinkle. Yisro was part of Pharaoh's cabinet. He was closely linked to one of the worst villains of Jewish history. And look what became of him. He escaped and he was rewarded that his descendants were the leaders of the Jewish people. The Talmud elsewhere tells us what was the origin of his transformation. Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin 104a is talking about how important it is to be charitable, to be kind, to be giving. And it's talking about specifically about feeding other people food. And it tells us how great is giving food to someone else. Because it brings those who are far close and it brings those that are close far. It takes people that are close and it distances them. And it takes people that are distant and it brings them close. And what are the examples? You have the nation of Ammon and Moab. They're relatives of the Jewish people. They're descendants of Lot. They should be close. But they didn't give the Jewish nation food when we left Egypt. And consequently, they were distant. They cannot marry amongst the Jewish people. And they have someone like Yisro. Where does he come from? He's a collaborator with Pharaoh. At least he was before he escaped. And what happened? Moshe also escapes from Pharaoh. And he arrives at the well. This is in chapter 2 of Exodus. And he saves the daughters of Yisro, of Jethro. And the daughters come back to their father. And he says, well, where is he? Bring him here. Let us give him bread. Let us give him food. And what happens as a result of that? The domino effect of that story is that Moshe marries Zipporah, the oldest daughter of Yisro. And eventually, they become part of the Jewish people. And his descendants are the great leaders of the Jewish people. Really interesting. The Talmud points out there's something very kind, very charitable about Yisro's behavior. In addition, the Talmud tells us that in this week's Parsha, in the 10th verse of the Parsha, after Yisro was regaled with these goosebump-inducing stories of the Exodus, he blessed God. Verse 10, And Yisro said, Blessed is Hashem, who has rescued you from the hand of Egypt and from the hand of Pharaoh, who has rescued the people from under the hand of Egypt, says the Talmud. This is a disgrace to the Jewish people because none of them blessed God until Yisro came, until Jethro came and blessed God. There's something that Yisro has demonstrated to the nation that they need to learn before Sinai. After all the miracles that had happened to the Jewish people, none of them blessed them. Yes, they sang at the sea. Of course, they had last week's parasha. After the splitting of the sea, the nation erupts in spontaneous song. But no one blessed God. And I think what our sages are telling us, by giving us all these snippets of Yisro's storyline, they're telling us that he serves as a very important template for what the Torah ought to do to us. Let's go back to last week. Last week, the Parsha begins. The Jewish people are leaving Egypt. 
and they're taking a very long circuitous route. Why are they taking the long route? Why don't they go directly to Israel? After all, they're leaving Egypt, they're going to Israel. Go a straight line. Well, the verse says, because maybe they want to return. Maybe they're going to get cold feet, they're going to have second thoughts, and they're going to want to go back to Egypt. Even though they left Egypt, Egypt didn't really leave them, and they may have second thoughts and want to go back. And then throughout the parsha, they're complaining. They don't have perfect faith in God. They doubt God. They have no food, and right away they complain. Right away they blame Moshe. They blame God. Apparently, the nation is not quite ready for showtime. Comes along Yisro. Comes along Jethro. And he shows us how this is supposed to be done. He is the model of the spiritual metamorphosis that the Torah advocates. Look where he came from. And look what he turned into. He was a cognoscenti of idolatry. There wasn't a single idol in the world that he didn't experiment with. But what happened? He fled Pharaoh. The way he was initially, he was part of the Egyptian team, but he transforms himself and became a new person. He has seven names. There's a very deep insight in that. He was always changing. And every time he changed, the Torah assigns him another name. His change wasn't surface level. It was fundamental. It was essential. And therefore it demanded that he receive a new name. When he encountered truth, it fundamentally changed him. He discovers the Torah is true. He takes the sword, takes the knife, and circumcises himself. Yes, the Jewish people, they sang after the Exodus. They sang after the splitting of the sea. But Yisro blessed. And the sages tell us that when you sing, you're acknowledging the miracle that was done for you. Blessing? That is a sign of change. That is a sign of metamorphosis. And that's the lesson of Yisro. And that is precisely what we need to hear before Sinai. Yisro was someone who was originally Egyptian and converted. You know what Sinai is? Sinai too was conversion. And Yisro was the model of how to do that. It is possible to go through the entire Sinai experience, to witness God, to see prophecy, to see things that no human has seen since, with the exception of the great prophets. It's possible to go through all of that and not change an iota. And of course, you have the people, the small group of people, that 40 days after the experience at Sinai, they do the golden calf. How is that possible? They did not take the lesson of Yisro. I think there's a very valuable lesson for us. We have a tendency to have a reversion to the mean, to have a regression, to go back to the place where, that we're comfortable with. We could be inspired. We could witness things that could potentially be life-changing. We can encounter truths that if they were to really penetrate us, if we were to really absorb and integrate them, we could be a different person. But by default, we're averse to change. We're comfortable in the world that we live in. The idea of change is very challenging, very difficult. You have the Jews. They witnessed the ten plagues. And they're suffering in Egypt. And their status tell us that 80% of them didn't want to leave. And therefore they died and they remained in Egypt during the plague of darkness. And you have 20% of people that do want to leave. These are people that are willing to change. And even the people that are willing to change, they have to take the circuitous route. If there's the easy escape hatch, if there's the emergency exit, they're probably going to pull that lever. They're probably going to go back to Egypt. And even the Egyptians. Last week's Parsha, we read about how they pursue the Jewish people with chariots. And Rashi asked the question, wait a minute, didn't all the animals die during the plagues? How do they have animals to pursue the Jewish people with? And the answer the Rashi tells us is that there were people who feared God amongst the servants of Pharaoh who brought in their animals during the plague and the animals survived. And Rashi concludes, the best of the Egyptians 
you kill them. The best, the most docile of venomous snakes, you crush their skull. The Egyptians also suffer from this problem. They too witnessed the miracles, and they too, initially, they feared God. They brought in their animals. But what happens after time? That inspiration goes away. And they are reverting back to the way they always were. And the Jewish people are no different. They had the experience. They had witnessed the ten plagues, but they're probably going to run back. And now they're about to witness something even more transformational. They're about to witness the Sinai experience. And we know there's still that risk that maybe it won't impact them at all. And therefore, they have to learn the story of Yisro. Look at Yisro. Look at him. He's always changing. Where does he come from? He comes from maybe the worst place of any Jewish hero. He is part of the Nazi cabinet. He's working with Pharaoh. He's a collaborator with one of the worst villains of our, of our history. And look what, what happens to him. His descendants are part of the Sanhedrin. His descendants are the leaders of the Jewish people. His son was Moshe. Where did that come from? So the Talmud tells us it came from kindness. It came from him being charitable. It came from him being good. There was something good about him that didn't tolerate this. But in addition, besides for the character of goodness and, and, and charity and kindness, he was someone who was tenaciously in pursuit of truth. He was someone, when he did encounter the truth, it automatically changed him to the degree that he had to get a new name. He was a new identity. He was a new person. And then he suffered another truth, and he became another new person until finally he became Yisro. And indeed, once he experienced the final truth, he circumcised, he's part of our team forever, and he merited to have his descendants be the great leaders of the Jewish people. I think there's a very, very valuable lesson from Yisro that's so critical, we have to hear it before Sinai, even if it actually happened chronologically after Sinai. This was a great pleasure to study this Parsha with you. I apologize for coming in so late. I know it's Friday, so it was a busy week, so I apologize for that. Hopefully next week, please God, we'll have a Parsha podcast done earlier in the week. Cannot promise, but I'm going to try. I thank you again for your listenership. Thanks for listening to the Parsha podcast. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Volby, coming from the Torch Center in Houston. Have an amazing Shabbos.